What's up, Craig? Hi, Craig. How you doing, buddy? You got our guest with you? Hey, uh, Craig. Nice to meet you. Hey, you do. I'm Grumpy Dungeon Master Christopher, along with Grumpy Dungeon Master Jay. And we have with us today probably the one of the best Dungeon Masters ever, Luke Gygax. How's it going? Hey, it's going well. Thanks so much for having me on here, and thank you for that really uh, generous uh, 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 title there. Uh, I don't claim to be the greatest or even close to the greatest GM, but I do enjoy GMing, and I think it's one of those things that we can all do. Uh, with a, you know, it, it, it's great. It brings a friend group together, and uh, honestly, GMing shows a lot of care uh, for your friends because uh, you're putting in three, four times as much work as uh, as everybody else. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> it really is true, man. Jimming, jimming. If you're lazy, kind of sucks. So, uh, yeah. because you got to do the prep, or be really, really, really good at extemporaneous uh, uh, speaking and just kind of going with the flow and making stuff up. I, I do a little bit of both. Uh, like I don't like writing things down, but I, I come up with crazy ideas, and I usually have a couple of weeks between game sessions to sort of figure out ideas. And then I can just, okay, this is what we're doing. Point A, point B, point C. And my players tend to enjoy themselves. I'm going to ask you a question. And mm-hmm. I ask every guest on here this. But because my, the question I normally would ask is, uh, what edition of D&D did you start with? But that would be a silly question to ask you. That you so we all kind of know the answer. My question for you is, what is or do you have a favorite edition? Of Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, that's pretty tough. Uh, I'm probably going to say Advanced Dungeons and Dragons simply because that was really what I learned on. I played OD&D and basic D&D a little bit, but really it was Advanced Dungeons and Dragons uh, from the age of like nine or ten years on. Uh, you know, as my dad was writing it in that time period and kind of implementing it. So uh, that's more where my memories are, you know, because yeah. as a kid, you, you don't remember that much. So AD and D is what I played for the longest. And then uh, I have to say fifth edition isn't bad. You know, I wasn't a huge uh, th- third edition or Pathfinder fa- fan. I thought it was a little bit too much uh, record keeping uh, kind of reminded me of some of the earlier systems like, you know, champions or something like that, where you, did you know it was a lot of record keeping or role master or yeah role master you've got charts for your charts that have charts yeah but that was the beauty of role master it really was i agree I mean, it just embraced the charts because you roll on the charts you're like oh my god i did so well i get to roll on more charts and that's <laughs> really fun uh and i totally enjoyed that i played a fair amount of role master and, and, and loved it uh but <clears throat> yeah fifth edition is good because uh ad and d i think the audience in a big audience, don't get me wrong, but it was more than likely to be, you know, your more scholarly types, your guy, you know, guys and girls who did did well in school, your nerds, nerds, yeah, yeah, nerds. because it seemed daunting, right? And you had to look up some charts, and you, there was it wasn't organized as well. We didn't have YouTube; you couldn't easily just drop in and watch somebody do it, right? I am way better at learning by listening to somebody. Tell me about it. Like, I'll retain that very well. Uh, if I read it, okay. not as good. So, uh, <laughs> for me, I was just raised playing it. I, don't, I, haven't read, I haven't read the Player's Handbook or DMG or any <laughs> of that stuff. I, 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 don't, I don't do a lot of reading, uh, but I will listen to things, and I retain it much, much better. So, uh, I certainly did, of course. You know, I know where certain things are. Like, I can flip open to... You know where you're going to buy your equipment in the book. I can open up the DMG to the to hit tables and and uh, saving throws or just you know, like a page after that, two pages after that actually, and then you know where the magic items start because those were fun and yeah. exciting to read, right? So I know where that is. But if you ask me a bit about building a keep or something, it's like, oh man, I got to go to the index and look it up. I don't. Yeah. I don't. What have what book is that even in? <laughs> it's in the DMG, but uh, uh, yeah. And then uh, of course, I mean that's such a rich I'm, i know i'm bouncing all over this that's such a rich uh, area that uh, my friend matt colville did his whole book on that right did he raise a couple million mm-hmm. dollars to, to yep. do that yeah uh yeah. keeps and followers or whatever he called that uh but just 
Yeah, I mean, that was such a huge, huge part of original D&D, and even in the, you know, AD&D in the early years, was achieving kind of like your lord level, your ninth, 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 ninth level. Yeah, ninth level, yep. And then you could attract followers, and that was a big deal. And so you'd want to know, well, where am I going to settle in? Where's like some frontier space that I can settle in and build? Am I going to build a tower? Am I going to build a little keep? Am I going to have enough to build a castle? How much is that going to cost? How many years is that going to take? Who are the henchmen I'm going to bring in? Uh, so that was like kind of like more of that was part of the game. And then, of course, you would play those henchmen because once you're ninth level, I mean, it's like you're near God status, right? I mean, what are you going to do? Pretty high level yeah. already. You got to start, got to start down at the bottom again. So, uh, I, anyways, I, I have really long answer to your very short question. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say that you, you skipped over fourth there. You don't didn't play fourth at all. Didn't like fourth. At all? I played I played fourth one time, Aww. and yeah, somebody it had come out. A, a friend of mine ran it, and it was a fine game. I, there's yeah. nothing wrong with fourth edition. It was it was very it was solid. It was a good game. I don't want to critic criticize folks who designed it. But in my opinion, it wasn't Dungeons and Dragons. If they'd said, yeah. hey, check out this game. Let's play it. I'd have played yeah. it and been like, wow, that's pretty fun. This is cool. But because they called it D&D, I was like, mm, no, it doesn't feel right. That is, a, that is actually a perfect answer to that. Uh, yeah, that, that's the decision I started on. Um, okay. Just for my, a little background about me. That I started on fourth and, and just transitioned straight into fifth. And it was... Like, oh, this is just so much better <laughs> for people to play. But fourth yeah. has like this 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 place for me is like, you know, the nice tactical board game thing. And like I I never saw the difference and but I I do know the people that have played it for a long time, like D D for a long time, just just can't stand playing fourth. So I, I still try to champion it just in case, but I always seem to lose out. <laughs> So yeah. I, I I got a, I got a question for you too. When when I was when I finally was able to get a hold of you and you agreed to do this, I talked to everybody uh, in our little friend group, our little DM group and GM group. Like, what was the main question we wanted to ask you? That's oh, yeah. one yeah. thing we needed to know Very more important. than anything else, and that was how much you lift, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I don't lift that much, man. I uh, um, I didn't start working out till I was thirty nine. Uh, I was in the, I joined the army when I was eighteen. Yeah. So I always did calisthenics and stuff, but I wasn't real like a gym rat or anything like that. But I went on a deployment to uh, Iraq in 2010, 2011. When I was uh, 39, I was almost turning 40. And I was like, man, you know, I really feel like I'm getting pudgy and, you know, it's not like I could do a whole lot. So I hung out with some guys and who like to go to the gym and I started lifting. And uh, that was a lot of fun. It was, it was, and, I, and I found that I really enjoyed it <clears throat> and something I've kept up. Uh, and since I retired uh, last year in September, uh, I just try to go to the gym and, and stay steady. But I'll be honest with you, 52, uh, trying to lift really heavy mm -hmm. hurts hurts your joints. Yeah, not and, a good uh, idea. Yeah, it, it it really does. So, uh, you know, I have a ruptured L5-S1, so I have a bad back, and I have some bulge discs in my neck after so many years, and tendonitis, blah, blah, blah. But, I mean, my bench... Uh, is probably 225 is kind of what I try to work out uh, for bench. I don't really do uh, squats or deadlifts anymore because of my back, uh, but I'll leg press six or seven plates on each side, so whatever that is. Um, I love that they actually yeah. gave a real answer. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it is, because like I said, you, you look fantastic, because uh, uh, that you. was your main photo on Instagram. And the second follow-up question to that, too, is you have an amazing beard. What's your What's your secret? Oh. Uh, just loving it. I, cause again, I was in the army for 33 years. So growing a beard was a rarity. I could get some scruff going. Uh, uh, but, uh, I use, oh geez, I forgot the name of the, the stuff that I use. Some sort of green, some sort of green putty that the, uh, that the, it's called pudding, beard pudding. Oh, so wow. whatever that is. Yeah. Some sort of uh, something beard pudding. It was whatever the lady at the, uh, um, uh, uh, sport clips, uh, said, Hey, would you like to buy some of this? And I was like, no. And I, I was like, no, but she put some on my beard, my hair. And I was like, oh, this is actually pretty good. So I went Thank to Amazon you. and purchased it. That's yeah. awesome. Thank you. Thanks yeah, for I'm... joining us on our podcast, <laughs> Beards and Workouts. Yeah, <laughs> Beards and Workouts. Well, I'm telling you what, man, uh, the workout thing is is good because, you know, I, I guess I just, uh, you know, by dint of being in the military for decades, uh, I had to stay in a, some sort of modicum of, of fitness level, right? Um, 
but uh, you, you know, from running GaryCon uh, in and just being around gamers all my life, we tend to be a sedentary crew, right? By and large, it's just, yeah. just it's just the way it is. I mean, I get it. I love to hang out, sit down, and what goes what goes well with with gaming. You know, having Pring- some Pringles and tacos. Oh my yeah, gosh, yeah. they sure do, man! And it's just <laughs> easy as you're going just to pound those down. And that's not really the most healthful way to live your life, guys. I'm just telling you this. Uh, it, it, and so, uh, you know, that 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 can be harmful. And I've, you know, unfortunately, type two diabetes and and health issues stuff like that. It just made me start thinking that maybe um, maybe there's something that we should do to encourage our comrades to get out and do something more, uh, do some physical stuff besides ha- having fun at the table and doing that sort of thing. Just to, just to help us out, just to live a little bit longer, yep. higher quality of life, be at the gaming table longer. I mean, one of the things, so uh, obviously I, you know, like I said, I, I joined the army at, at 18 and I was doing my own thing. I always loved gaming. It's been part of my life. I, I you know, obviously grew up in my father's household, but I had my own, my own, life uh you know my father uh passed away in 2008 march 4th of 2008 and uh there was this huge outpouring of of uh folks who maybe didn't know my father or had met him once in passing or had corresponded with him in an email who wrote and said wow uh it feels like i lost someone close to me because you know i didn't know gary However, his game changed my life, and it did this for me. I was painfully shy, and through this game, I learned how how to connect with people, and I got to practice, you know, speaking to others. And I found that that helped me overcome my, you know, my problems in in the real world. Uh, or I had a learning disability, but these books were so interesting, and people were having so much fun. I read them, and now I overcame my my learning uh, disability, my dyslexia, whatever it may have been. And, uh, you know, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I've, I'm a professor. Uh, they, they have had success. Uh, tons of creative people. Um, and, and, and so, uh, you know, these things started coming in in 2008, and uh, I decided with my brothers and sisters that we should have a gathering outside of the funeral, obviously the funeral is small and private, where we just welcome anyone who drove to Lake Geneva, because some people just wrote on posts, I'm going to drive to Lake Geneva to pay my respects. And we're like, oh my gosh, do they know that Lake Geneva is like 6,000 people and there's like really nothing here? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we we felt, you know, we should at least have an event where we could welcome them. And we did. I rented the American Legion Hall. We put up uh, 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 a screen and people got to watch the D&D cartoon, the Futurama episode that my dad was on. Uh I had a podium set up with a speaker so you could share your favorite story about my dad and everybody played games. And, of course, my dad loved all sorts of games, whether it's role-playing games, miniatures, board games. He loved railroads. So any game, yeah, he played chess, shogi, pinochle. He loved games. Games mm. of all varieties and all, all sorts. <clears throat> and so we did that. And uh, at the end of that, someone said it was so much fun. I should do it again the next year. And I did, and I called it GaryCon. And that's how GaryCon uh, uh, kind of was born. Uh, 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 but uh, you know, running GaryCon has really uh, tuned me in uh, to the community more so, and all the really amazing benefits that D and D brings to those of us who play. Right, the connection, the friendships, uh, and I bet you know your listeners and you will 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 be like, "Well, no kidding, Luke," <laughs> because you've lived it, right? It's, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, I mean, it's true. Right, your best friends, you share this bond, you create this bond. Shared hardships, right? Shared sufferings. And yeah, it's all make-believe, right? But when we're together, right, playing a game, and then, you know, we convene, you know, months later, years later, hey man, do you remember that time when you threw the disintegrate spell (laughs) and the black dragon failed at saving throw and you saved us? Right? None of it, you know, notice how I didn't say, do you remember when we were playing D&D? And you rolled yeah. the dice as a character, right? That's not how we talk about it, right? To us, in our minds, this is real. Yeah. You saved me by throwing this spell. You did this really cool thing. And it, there was danger. There was tension. And, it, you know, it was, it was life or death. 
So you do that over a period of years with people and you form really strong bonds uh, yeah. with these people and they're your support network. And I, I think that has a ton of value uh, 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 for me. I guess I could just speak for myself no. as a middle-aged guy with uh, you know family. And when I was working, you know, all the time, there was not a whole lot of, not a whole lot of time for me to do stuff with my peers. Right. I was at work or I was at home, uh, you know, taking care of kids and, and family stuff, which is great, but it's not, you know, with your peer group. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but through gaming, man, that was awesome. And, uh, you know, I got to reconnect and, and it was, it was work too. Right. So I'd get to play games and connect with by peer group and, and just have a good time. So. And, and, and sort of as you get older, uh, like it, you want a community that you are close to that has similar values or at the very least similar interests to hang out with, to be around. You know, last night I was hanging out with people I met through Dungeons and Dragons specifically, and we were playing Frosthaven. We're just hanging out, having a good time, playing a board game. You know, I, I see these people about once a week on average, and you know, we get together. We do different gaming if we're not playing D anD D, and it you know it's just a community that we've built up around here. And there's a lot of gamers that aren't necessarily in my tabletop group that I still know in my local area, just because of Dungeons and Dragons or Magic the Gathering or other similar style gaming. Yeah, I think the yeah, word that you, as you say, the word you use that really resonates with me is community. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's it's the local gaming community around here. Yeah, I, I definitely noticed that since like I've ran Adventure Adventures League at my local gaming store, and I, I've I've made a number of really good friends from that. And then COVID happened, and AL disappeared. But now I, I brought AL back, and the explosion has just been even bigger. I've met more people, making more friends, and it, it wasn't. It, it doesn't even have to really be like in person stuff too. Like I played World of Warcraft religiously <laughs> for so many years, and I have some really good friends I got out of that that I still talk to on a daily basis. So not even all the time does it have to be around the table, but just like any game that you can sit and you know have a community with. Um, Jay and I LARP um, in uh, Kings Mountain, North Carolina. And all of our friends, you know, once yeah. we've made there and went out there, we still have and we still get together with and game with yep. and like play D&D &D with. <laughs> yeah, like as I get older, I'm LARPing less and less often because it's a, it's a drive for me. It's you know, physically exhausting, not enough sleep over the course of the weekend. But I still make time to go specifically to see people that I see only a few times a year. Yeah, and if we if I showed up and we didn't even LARP, I would still be okay with it because I'm still hanging out with people that I have a bond with. Yeah, we that, definitely that, would be rolling dice. <laughs> yeah, we would. That very much reflects uh, how I feel. Uh, the Gary Khan community has come together. I mean, and this is the community that's spread out across the nation and a few of them internationally, even. Uh, but. For those of you who don't know, Lake Geneva, Wisconsin is in, in southeastern Wisconsin. It's about an hour and 20 minutes from O'Hare Airport in Chicago and about an hour from the Milwaukee Airport, a little bit, you know, more of a regional airport um, <clears throat> there. But uh, Lake Geneva is a town of six, six or maybe 7,000 people. There's no bus or transit or shuttle that runs there. <laughs> so if you come to Lake Geneva for GaryCon in March when the weather could be 60 degrees or it could be 10 degrees and snow. Uh, and, <laughs> and, that, and on the same weekend, <laughs> that could yeah. be days apart, uh, uh, to, you know, come out and hang out and celebrate uh, a life well played, celebrate my father's life and, and works, uh, you really want to be there. And so yeah. it's, I mean, people come there, come there with just a wonderful attitude. And I've heard it described as, a family reunion, but not with your biological family, with your gamer family, you know, the people that you choose to hang out with. And uh, it's really palpable. As soon as people arrive for Gary Khan, it feels warm, welcoming. People walk up and talk to one another. It's, it's exactly the vibe that I wanted to, uh, that I wanted to create. Uh, and it reminded me of the, 1970s 
conventions that were like two or three hundred, you know, probably two, maybe three hundred people at most. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and there were the little regional uh, conventions that we'd hold in Lake Geneva with the American Legion Hall. And uh, there was Spring Revel and Winter Fantasy. And I was a boy of seven or eight years old. But I could walk up to any table and just ask people, <clears throat> hey, uh, what game are you playing? And they didn't say, hey, beat it, kid. <laughs> they said, oh, uh, we're playing this game. Do you want to learn? Because it were, I mean, back then, it was such a small community. You really f wanted to foster people's interests and welcome them into the fold and kind of give them a, you know, hey, man, let me show you what this is about. I understand, you know. But the fact that you're asking me is really cool. Because imagine, remember what the, the, the white box, uh, or sorry, brown box or white box, whatever your you know, OD and D rule set L said? A little yellowed. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. But uh, I'll, I'll get up and I'll hold, give me one second. I'll get up and I'll go read it because it's so unwieldy. I can't even read what it, remember what it says. Yeah, go for it. All right. So here's a, a white box set. We, I think I got this from my dad, but, uh, uh, we sold all the wood set, wood grain sets because that's what they're for, right? So yep. I don't even have a wood grain set. All, all you collectors out there, very sad I don't have one. But <laughs> so, somebody hook him up. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's just a minor $20,000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, nothing big, right? <laughs> it's pocket change. Yeah. I'm yep, sure I'm, you're able I, to find one in one of his estate sales. Yeah, I, I, I do. I actually resell for a living, and occasionally I come across awesome stuff like that. So if I find one, it is yours. All right, dude. I appreciate it. Thank you. That that's very that's exceedingly kind. But it wasn't a role playing game back in the day. It was rules for fantastic medieval war games campaigns playable with pen, paper and pencil and miniature figures. <laughs> so Dungeons and Dragons, pretty genius. I'll give my dad credit for that one. But the kind of collegiate sub sub you know second <laughs> title or whatever they call it on there is horrible. This does not roll off the tongue. Rules for fantastic <laughs> medieval war games, campaigns playable with paper and pencil and miniature figurines. It's just a mouthful. <laughs> it is a lot. And there's a lot of ands and withs and stuff. Yeah. So uh, uh, anyway, but yeah, if you make it to, if you make it to Gary Khan, you really, 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 really want to be there. And uh, it, it has changed lives and, and it, it's a wonderful, wonderful place to be. So if yeah. you, if you want to come to a convention, small convention uh, and really, learn about the history and have a, have a great time chatting with people. Um, it's kind of been described as the highest, uh, uh, wizards to muggle ratio convention. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because, because we have a lot of guests, a lot of people come to Gary Khan because they really want to be there and they happen to have be folks who were instrumental to Dungeons and Dragons in the early days and, and all the way through, to be honest with you. I mean, Mike Morales comes there all the time. He's the guy who created fifth edition and we have, you know, Tim Cask there, who was the editor of Dragon Magazine, their first, mm -hmm. you know, editor of Dragon Magazine. So, uh, of course, you know, we've had tons and tons of uh, uh, of people in between as well. Anyways, sorry yeah. about that. You got to no, uh, you got to cut me off, or I'll keep talking. <laughs> no, that's fine. It's, yeah, you're the guest, man. We're we're here to let you say what you got to say. Uh, it, Gary Con is actually the um, the one that we've talked me and Jay have talked the most about going out and going to, because we kind of feel like that's the one that if we went there, you know, would we be going there as fans or just like, you know, throwing out the grumpy dungeon. We're not that big, but you know, get, get our name out that way. But like, we just want to go there just to be around that energy, you know, it's a good, it's a good time. I mean, yeah. just the, the bottom line is it is, it is fun. It is. Uh, I poured my heart into this. I mean, I really, this is not just, it's not a business venture for me. This is personal, mm -hmm. it's personal for my family and myself. And so this is really my family reunion. Uh, and it's, I've invited all of, you know, all my gamer family to come too. Yeah. And uh, we're up to about 3000 people, but it's still, I mean, <laughs> you know, you can still, that's yeah. a lot of gamer. That's a lot of gamers in one place. Yeah. It is, but we, we take it over, we take over the place, but it doesn't feel antiseptic. Yeah, it really yeah. It, it does not. And I, and, and I unfortunately like I, I have the pleasure and I say that with quotations of the only con that I ever get to go to. And it's been a long time at this point was Dragon Con down here in Atlanta. That's big. And it, mm -hmm. I mean, you're you're talking 60,000 nerds that take over downtown Atlanta for a weekend. And it's probably bigger than that now. 
It's yeah. a very different feel. And it's a, it, it, it's yeah. not a gaming convention. It's just it's not. A, it's a fandom or cosplay yeah. convention. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's more yeah. akin to Comic Con. Yeah, I went there in the eighties with my dad. I went there once, uh, and I couldn't even drive, so I was fourteen or fifteen maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh when I went there. And it was a good time, but it was it was uh I think I met it would have been a lot smaller back then too. It was way smaller, yeah. yeah. I think that might have been where I met Piers Anthony, uh, okay. the author who's pretty yep. pretty cool guy. So it might have been either that or it might have been at a book show in, in Baltimore. I went to both of those in the same year. But no, it was a fun time. We had a we had a good time. Uh but now I understand it's more like Comic Con. And man, I'll tell you what, the Comic Con's rough. I can't I really I went there one time and yeah. I hate I hated it. I want I to. It. I, I really want to go to San Diego Comic Con with my brother at some point because he's a huge fan of of Marvel and comics and all of that. But it, I, I know it's not the con for me. Um, no, I mean, too uh, many people. It's yeah. too many people, dude. It's 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 too many people. If you want to wait in line for three hours to do something, it's a place to be. You know, <laughs> if you if you if you love if you love Disneyland on Christmas vacation. Then yeah, you're gonna you're gonna like it. But I found it horrible. I hate waiting in lines. Uh, I did a lot of waiting in lines in the army. I don't want to do it. I mean, elsewhere. I was at, I was at a con t- uh, in Huntsville, Alabama, two weeks ago. Uh, like it wasn't even a big con per se. William Shatner was there. Oh a few, yeah, a few, a few of the Star Trek people and all. But it took us an hour and a half just to get in the doors. And this is Huntsville we're talking about. We're not talking yeah. about you know Atlanta or San Diego or somewhere. I don't uh, like waiting lines any more than anybody else. Well, Huntsville, so, Alabama has uh that's where all the aviators go to learn the helicopter. Yeah. Yeah, but, that's yep. mm-hmm. lot, lots of lots of military stuff up there. <laughs> lots of yep. NASA things. Well, if you're ever near Columbia, uh South Carolina in January, uh we have a friend of ours who runs his own con called Scarab in columbia uh every january been around, been around for a while too yeah and all it is is just people playing games it sounds very much like like gary con it just no no you know couple maybe you know room just a thing just to have made some guests but just people playing games i went there a couple of years ago and sat down and just watched my friends play second edition for like six hours and watched all of them die horribly it was great and fantastic and that was second just the energy ed. of yep. the room. <laughs> <laughs> That's second ed for sure. Yeah. So for me, I mean, Gary Khan is is for me. It's about playing games. It's about mm-hmm. meeting people, and it's about making friends and sharing good times and 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 and, and making new stories and adventures with each other. So uh, for Gary Khan, I mean, I don't know. I really have worked to keep badge prices pretty low. It was a hundred bucks last year, mm-hmm. but that's for four days. Yeah. And the vast yeah. majority, like ninety-eight percent of games, are free. There's no charges. You just yeah, you, you play games. There's a couple like if you want to play at three thirty Center Street, where I grew up and where D and D was written. There's a charge. I actually lose money on that <laughs> to do it, <laughs> but the lady wants money. Who owns the house? She wants money to to be there. So, I mean, whatever we charge, I pay her and I yeah. absorb the sales tax and and credit card fee so it's a small loss for me but it's a really cool thing and i don't want to charge more than 100 bucks yeah. a seat yeah uh, to do it so uh but other than that it's just you know there's like maybe a little uh, uh like um through dungeon you know type of thing that goes on there that's 20 bucks or whatever it is but yeah. uh, other than that it's like free you know every game is free uh so, it, 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 and and better because they're, because they're free I, I do this because it's free they're, it's not complicated you don't need a ticket to get into any game and we put mm-hmm. A green sign and a red sign at every table. If you got a space and you want to, and there's somebody who can play, put up the green sign. If you're walking around and you don't have anything to do and you see a green sign, walk up and be like, what game are you playing? Can I join you? And the answer should be yes, because the green sign is up. Get in there and play games. Learn new games, meet new people, make new friends. Which, which, color, uh, which color do you have to put out to get more meat at the table? You more meat at the table? Yes, that's, that's a very similar. There is a blue card that you can hold up because we have table side service. So, oh, wow. Uh, oh, wow. Okay, but sure. Yeah. Oh, no. Blue so, this. Uh, no, it totally, it totally segues in. Uh, because at Gary Con, it's about gaming, and we don't want you to have to get up and go to a concession stand and get it like a nasty hot dog or whatever it is, right? You can order chicken sandwich, a salad, pita bread, whatever it is, a pizza, 
you can order that hot dog if you really want it, or bratwurst, or that sort of thing, and they'll bring it to the table along mm-hmm. with a nice, a, a nice cold beer if you want it. Oh man! Uh, while you play your game, and you just awesome. handle it right there. Yeah. So it's it's really, um, it's different than other conventions. I haven't been to the conventions that are like that. We also have you know all sorts of great features. I'll you know, when you show up on Wednesday night to pick up your badge early for you know early badge pickup. I order like. I don't know, like 20 pizzas and a barrel of beer and people can drink beer and socialize and have pizza. I have wow. happy hour on Friday and Saturday where if you have the Gary Khan Stadium Cup, you get free beer and uh, or free soda. If you're if you don't care to imbibe alcohol, it's totally fine. We have, we have soda there. Um, yeah, we just do a little fun stuff. We had screenings of the D&D movie uh, that people would go wow. to for free uh, <laughs> last year. Um, so, yeah, how'd, how'd you like it, by the way? I thought it was great, man. I, yeah, I really I loved it was it. an en- it was an enjoyable film. Uh, you know, was it just like a D and D adventure? No. Uh, was it supposed to be? No, it wasn't. I mean, people need to lighten up. The uh, the druid couldn't have done that many shape changes. I get it. Yeah, in third edition, Come yes, on, they man. can. <laughs> well, I saw I saw her stat block on D and D Beyond. She absolutely can. It says so in the rules. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, why why are you nitpicking and in in and really trying to be difficult? I mean, I guess that's that's what social media is about sometimes. Yeah. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be a grumpy grumpy guy, right? Get off my lawn, <laughs> kid. Uh and uh, and so I can do that. I think too. we I think we brought it up and complained about it just for like half a second, but we were just like, eh, who cares? <laughs> yeah, we don't care. I, it's it's fine to know. Fun. I think you note that that doesn't follow the rules very well. However, it was a cool a depiction in a movie and and 75 percent or more of the people who watch it don't know and don't give a shit about yeah the rule set right they want to be entertained and it's that's its job is to entertain now when we're playing a role-playing game it's a little different we're entertaining yeah. each other and part mm-hmm. of that is engaging one another and including them and highlighting the features of their character right yeah, it, a, a movie is much more passive. All right, so yeah. we got to we got to allow them. It's a different style of storytelling. Uh, it's not a cooperative storytelling, which is what <laughs> role playing is. So we all participate in that. Here we're just a passive viewer. Let them tell the story, man. Just you know, that actually that actually kind of uh, brings you up to like one of the questions I had prepped for you. Um, yeah. I'm hoping I'm hoping you never got this question before, and. Um, I'm hoping has, I got. I hate new questions. So, all right, all right, here we go. Here we go. Has there? So you you grew up, of of course, you know, and your your dad's legacy. Yeah. When he taught you to play Dungeons and Dragons and how to be a dungeon master, how to be a game master, is there anything that he passed along to you that so many years later you have a difference of opinion on now, or just you just never agreed with? Hmm. I haven't gotten this question before, so so it's a new one, uh, and it's fine. It's it. it I would say that uh, it's a lot. A lot has evolved over the years. Yeah, just like anything else. No surprise, right? Culture mm-hmm. changes. People, you know, your taste change. Clothing styles change, right? Uh, uh, so that's that. That's to be expected. So my dad came out of a military wargaming mm-hmm. kind of kind of background right so he wasn't he wasn't rp heavy he did move more towards rp over time right Mm -hmm. but in the early days certainly not there wasn't it's like hey hey, let's let's get to the adventure it's a dungeon crawl let's get to the trap part let's get to the mapping and and figuring out the bits that were considered entertaining then which was kind of puzzle solving through Mm -hmm. the drawing of a map and finding areas that might have secret spaces and that sort of thing and figuring that out right um and and how to defeat how to use tactics to defeat various creatures or you yeah. know traps and puzzles that were that were in the way um what did he teach me that i that i didn't like i think he didn't fudge any die rolls and i'll be honest <laughs> with you. i would fudge a die roll i will fudge a die roll for the rule of cool if it's a great you know story thing if my rolls suck I'm going to make a couple of them hit to keep that tension level higher. If I roll 
all crits and I'm going to crush the party and destroy them, and it's not their fault, it's just a lucky die roll, they were playing smart, I'm, I'm going to fudge that a little bit. So uh, I don't mind saying that. I, uh, I try to maximize, ma- maximize the fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I can. I can. I, uh, there's times when I'll adopt a, hey, we're going to run this old school, let the dice fall where they may, and I'll just roll out in the open. And it's yeah. just, that's how, that's how it is. And that's okay. If I'm doing a one shot, two more horrors or something, dude, I'm going to kill you all anyway, if I can't. So like, just, <laughs> just deal with it. Right. This is a foregone conclusion. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm, so not- I'm notorious for that, by the way, not fudging right. roles like at adventures league, because adventures league, I, there's always like new people that show up who don't understand the, the dynamic a lot of the times. Yeah. So my stance for that has always been just, I'm going to roll out in the open. You can see what I roll. So you know, you can establish trust with me that I am not trying to kill you. You know, the die says you're about to die. So you're about to die. Fifth um, it's yeah. fifth edition. You can't kill them, bro. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> yeah. It's well, going to be really hard. I just, well, I, I, hang on, hang on. Before you continue this down this <laughs> line, I want you to know he kills a minimum of one character a week. <laughs> that's awesome. Good job. That's hard to do. That's a skill set, dude. That's That's like rough. Okay, uh, I've I've been running uh, the, my my adventure league group through um, from the keys from the golden vault, the new uh, campaign book that came out. We did the third, no, sorry, the second uh, heist in there, which is like this devil casino, yeah. and they got to the one fight in the whole campaign, right. which is an undead minotaur versus seven level seven level two players. I, I mean, okay. okay. Yeah. Dude, but you, how? <laughs> how with one creature did you kill them? Because they get dropped uh, to zero. How did their friends not say, like, word of healing, whatever the mother million things I can do to return you to so a living they, status? There was a trap right before the room that took them all to about half hit points. Okay. And so the minute they went through and engaged with the Minotaur, the, uh, the undead Minotaur, which is more of like a Minotaur clockwork in this in this thing Got but it? i use okay. the undead mentor stats sure. and it was like third in initiative so it the barbarian went in he attacked but didn't rage for whatever reason i was like hey do you want to rage and it was like no nah, i'm good no, i'm gonna right, reserve cool. that for later yeah <laughs> right so the, the mentor backed up five feet charged the charged the goblin uh, uh barbarian hit him with uh his horn attack and again i roll right out in the open i crit okay. so he's down he's gone um then another person goes in and well it, in. It, it doubled the hit points in the damage so it just straight up killed him oh Yo. yeah oh right okay they're pretty low level okay got it yeah got it okay that makes sense yeah okay and then the other ones the group left him to die because i charged another person got him down to just a zero he was on the other horn of the Minotaur. And they were like, well, okay, screw this. And they closed the door and just left it in that room alone. Oh, okay. Oh, no, that's, okay. That's, that's, just, that's just not great play from the, the players. I, I, yeah. what I'm going to say. <laughs> so. Adventure League is Adventure's a lot like, like that in my, in my own campaign that I stream on Twitch. Yeah. Uh, I, in, my, in my campaign group this time, I had two kills. Uh, both from the same monster, actually. Uh, one at the very beginning of the campaign, or like near the middle beginning, and one at the very last session. And it was a Paragon uh, receptionist who was actually a succubus in disguise. Okay. And uh, for both characters, very different circumstances. She did charm them. She did get the succubus kiss on them, and they just went straight to dead because they were weak. So, I mean, it happens, and my players, my players understand me, and they understand that I just... I don't really fudge rolls. Sometimes I'll fudge tactics. I will be I will be honest about that. I could have wiped the group by using like the third fireball from the the mage, but eh, I wasn't gonna do that. I mean, that's like, just, yeah, that's I mean, that, cruel. Yeah, it does. It be, yeah, I mean because then you have to get more inventive and be like, how do I create some demigod or whatever who's going to bring them back so that they can do this and then they owe them or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. Where it's sometimes it's better to, to fudge it that way. Uh, yeah, I guess I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe I play with some pretty decent players. Well, <laughs> they, don't, I mean, they don't often screw up. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, fifth edition is definitely a lot harder to, to kill people in. Like, because 
I started uh, Red Box Basic and then Second Edition. So I, I've played the earlier editions where it. Yeah, you start off at first level. It's actually possible to die during character creation. <laughs> dude, I, I'm telling you what, dude. I, I'm just. I mean, this is. I, I mean, this is just this year, in Mar- at Gary Con in March this year. I played uh, just a fantastic game. Uh, my friend Andrew Perry, with the uh, uh, Warp Guilds of, uh, um, it's a it, you know gaming group that he's had together for about forty years. Uh, it's like 200 players now. They've created oh, wow. skills. Yeah, but he, wow. uh, you know, he met my dad when he was when he was young. Uh, you know, he came up to Lake Geneva. He was in the Chicago land area. He came to Lake Geneva and bumped into my dad and chatted with him. And my dad was was a pretty, uh, you know, friendly person, and welcoming, and kind of like people have said about Stan Lee. Uh, you know, if you write him, he might write you back. And so uh, uh, Andrew met my dad. My dad gave him a, a die. <laughs> I remember the metal die that my dad had at the time. Uh, he had a bunch of them. He gave him a metal die, and Andrew still has this uh, today. And just started chatting with him. So Andrew would write him little postcards. My dad would respond. Uh, and and they talked about, yeah, right? And he was just a kid. He's a young man. You know, he's 10 or 12. Oh, man, it's cool. And... Uh, he'd played barrier peaks and he was excited about the, all the levels, you know, the additional parts like, Hey, what's coming for barrier peaks. And so he started mapping out all the levels that would, of the ship that, that would be there and put them on like, you know, like a pizza holder has like several racks mm-hmm. or whatever. And so he came up and showed my dad that apparently, and my dad had looked at it and was like, okay, this is pretty cool. It's probably one of those things my dad never got to. Right. You know, uh, 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 but, uh, he's, uh, Andrew's been playing this campaign beyond barrier peaks with all the additional levels and the stuff that he's made up the continuation for decades. And so, uh, I played it in like 2018 and I loved it. And so I played it, played, you know, a couple adventures with some different, different groups. But when Joe Manganello uh, told me that he was going to bring some of his gaming group there and he's going to be shooting the, uh, 50 years of D&D documentary at Gary Khan this year. He's like, uh, it'd be cool if we play a game. I'm like, yeah, let's let's do it. And I'm like, who do you got? And he's like, well, I've got, you know, Mike Merles and myself and Chris Pernosky, who owns an animation studio that does like Vox Machina and some other, other games. Uh, he's like, uh, I'm like, okay, who else is going to play? And so we ended up, <clears throat> over time, uh, it, it was uh, Tom Morello, who's a guitarist from... Uh, Rage, Rage Against the, yep. yeah, Rage Against the Machine. Uh, Vince Vaughn, actor who is in tons and tons of films, including Wedding Crashers and you know Dodgeball yep, yep. and things like that. Uh, Bold you know, move, set, <laughs> yeah, it was great. Yeah, uh, I, I was there. Mike Murrells, who wrote Fifth Edition. Uh, you know, Chris Murnowski that I mentioned. James Hunter, who's uh, writ, wrote uh, Viridian Gate and several other lit RPG things. Uh, uh, Joe Manganiello and his brother Nick uh, and. Jim Kitchen, who's the auctioneer at at, at, at Gary Con, uh, you know, so we're all there, just you know, going through Beyond Barrier Peaks, and and man, it was just amazing. an amazing. Th- it, it, well, well, it was it was amazing. We were playing one E, and and these guys, you know, just like the rest of us, right? Didn't we play in in you know junior high school and high school, maybe college? Life happens. You have kids, all sorts of stuff. You know, Tom and and Vince had just come back to it. Oh, sorry. Paul White was also there. He's known as yep. the big the big show in yep. in, uh, <laughs> in WWE. Just the nicest guy, by the way. Sir, ma'am, like super polite. What a gentleman he is. And hilariously funny. Uh, but do not screw around when you're playing a D&D game with Paul White. He is super <laughs> serious. And he does not <laughs> like people fooling around. He will let you know. That you're not, you're like, it's okay, hey, focus, we're playing a game. And when you're seven foot <laughs> four, 450 yeah. pounds, dude, I gave him a hug. I'm 6'3 and like 270. I gave this like a guy, I gave him a hug good night. I couldn't get my arms around him all the way. He's a big, yeah, yeah. So, dude. So, yeah, Chris, uh, he's all, how tall are you, Chris? Mm-hmm. Six foot nine, 400. Oh, right you're now. Big, oh, you're a big dude. Okay, yeah, yeah, hard to so, tell uh, online. 
I, yeah, I would love to meet like someone bigger than me. Like that's like the goal. <laughs> not just well, not just like tall and skinnier, but like just bigger. And like the big show would be one of those people. He's a big dude. He's a big dude. Super nice guy. Just what like I said, what a gentleman. What a, a very very funny, self deprecating. I really enjoyed uh, meeting Paul. And thank you, gentlemen, if he ever hears this. Uh, he was it was it was a pleasure meeting him. Uh, <laughs> but we're yeah we're we're playing this we're we're playing this game. It was great and. and uh, I, I mean, I don't know. That was It's got to be a highlight for me. Yeah, uh, I mean, It sounds like a great crew of oh. people to be playing it with. And that's so, what that's what makes the games is who you play it with. But the first but the earlier it was it was second edition, but we're still making we're 12th level, right? We're average mm-hmm. at 12th level. We're making Saber die. Checks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Saber die, bro. Not just like Saber. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, it's like this is it for you, dude. You're done. If you roll below a 12, you're you're screwed. Uh, that's a different tension level <laughs> than fifth edition, where it's like, okay, if you miss this one, we're gonna give you like five different ways that you can get out of this. You have to roll like, yeah, below a five several times. The yeah. only time I've ever seen somebody fail a save or die in fifth edition is an intellect devour, uh, because <laughs> they 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 do still have the ability to one shot kill somebody, but. It was two failed saves in a row, and not just failed, like two natural ones that killed the barbarian, who <laughs> who, who was pretty much not going to die to anything, and then just straight up, yeah. oh, nope, he's dead. Yeah. I ran through, it, I ran through Tomb of Annihilation um, okay. right before COVID. Actually, when COVID hit, before I started streaming, I ran Tomb of Annihilation. I killed eleven players going through that <laughs> because a lot of the stuff in there was save or die, you know. Or save and take a bunch of damage, and if you're brought to zero, you die. I think there was like one or two save or die traps. Um, yes. It, it but is I a also, whole other level of tension, yeah. I also took Tomb of Horrors last year, and I revamped it and called it the Tomb of Refurbishment. <laughs> and I ran my own kind of like small tournament and just kind of updated it so 5th edition would flow better with the traps and kind of make it faster. So people get the four you out gotta, of all. You got to share that with me because I run one e. I run a one e tomb of horrors, like speed tomb of horrors, where I try to get people through in like two or three hours. Yeah, and uh, yeah. So I'd love to see what you do in fifth edition. Yeah, I'll, I run a I'll, I'll definitely send it to you. I uh, basically the concept behind it was is that I looked at the the lore for the thing and found out like Vecna came through and destroyed it during fourth edition. I got the book that describes it all right here, and. So I was like, okay, so it's a, a destroyed place. So the grumpy DMs bought it for for copper on the gold, and okay. they've re- recreated it as a tomb of refurbishment. And I said I ran a tournament with that, and I actually got the tournament coming up again this this in July here in Charleston. So I, I don't know what exactly I'm going to run yet, but but uh, I I did put the the tomb of refurbishment for free up on DMs Guild for people to grab, and I'll make sure you get a copy of that. Yeah, Send me a copy. Maybe I'll run it as a is a is a fun <laughs> thing too. Because I because I'll I'll run it at, at conventions and mm-hmm. people love it. People love yeah. Tomb of Horrors and love to get murderized in Tomb of Horrors. It 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 was, it was great. We had three we had three tables, um, and I don't think anyone survived the whole thing. I think one one group got into like the last room on the first level, and that was it. That's as far as they got. It was like <laughs> half the party is down. But then the time came up and they weren't able to get it. Um, but yeah, it was it was so much fun watching that and just watching people kind of go through and run that whole uh, thing. And it, it just it was it was like I said, I, I've met so many good DMs from that. Um, we we have one get that guests on here every once in a while just to you know talk about DM stuff. And like you said, going back to like your original conversations, like just you build a small community out of it, and you know it just kind of explodes from there. Yeah. So and then, you, and then, then you make your own the de, de game design company, which I do want to talk about when we get to that. Oh, uh, yeah. Gaxworks. No, that's fine. Yeah, Gaxworks. Uh, you know, for those of you who are listening, uh, like I said, I, just, I was in the military for a long time. I've loved gaming. It's been a hobby of mine. I've done a few things here and there uh, over time, but uh, I'd like to make it, you know, a bit more uh, uh, of a of a part of my life certainly gary Khan is a, a huge part of my mm-hmm. life and I'd, I'd like to also have a publishing arm which i wanted to keep distinct from gary Khan because really gary Khan's about yeah. my dad and and and, and you know, his life's work and promoting that legacy and all the positive aspects of gaming and then you know of course i want to publish my own my own yeah. uh, my own stuff the, Ga- the gary Khan is the personal and the gax works is the professional 
Yeah, I think so. Yeah. It really is. It, it really is personal for me. I mean, Ga- uh, Gary Khan is is, and it's hard because, gosh, uh, you know, yes, it's about my dad, but some people, you know, have no idea. You know, they're younger, maybe mm-hmm. or newer, newer, younger in gaming, uh, mm-hmm. and 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 so they 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 don't have a connection to my dad, and they just think, wow, this is a really cool. This is a really cool convention because there's lots of neat stuff that's going on. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, that's okay. I don't mind that because what I hope to see from those folks and, you know, my dad's name has been out of circulation for 15 years, guys, you know, nothing has really come out uh, of his. So it's amazing that people still remember him. I mean, I think that's a a huge, uh, you know, nod to my father's, uh, impact on, on popular culture. Uh, but I agree it's been lessened, but if people come to Gary Khan, because we have a great Adventures League track or whatever the case may be, uh, and they learn about the roots of their hobby, I think that's a huge win. Uh, and also, <laughs> um, sometimes, I don't know if you've heard this, uh, you know, especially Chris being a bit of a, a newer player, uh, some of the old players look down their nose at the young players in, in 5th edition and think, oh, 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 you're not playing D- <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons correctly. It needs to be played this way. Uh, so I've I think heard that before. Great. Yeah, I think it's great when we can get people together who are all loving D&D for whatever edition they're playing, mm-hmm. and they're getting things out of it, and they can share that with one another and go, wow, this is what I'm doing, and I, this is what I love. And some of the old school players can be like, this is what I do, and this is what I love. And there's a crossover there, and they go, "Oh yeah, you know what? This is this is I can dig this too." And uh, I, I've seen it happen at Gary Con where uh, you know some staunch people who are very much into the old school will get a chance to play some Fifth Edition and, and enjoy it, and have a good mm-hmm. time. And certainly, some of the newer players will play old historical miniatures games and get an appreciation of of where D and D came from, or play old school. And be like, oh, yeah, this is what you guys are talking about. Okay, it's very different. This is neat. Uh, and, and just appreciate those aspects. Uh, your favorite game, there is, a, in my opinion, there's no wrong way to play D&D. If you and your group are you know, having an adventure, having fun, laughing mm-hmm. and spending quality time together, that's a win. Yeah. We agree. That's yeah, it. I, that's, that's I, it. I, I, like, I like to leave them laughing or crying, one of the two. Yeah, just, you know, <laughs> I mean... Uh, a horror, like uh, 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 a terrible from the players, uh, from the characters' perspective, just, oh my gosh, everything went wrong. Uh, and, oh my gosh, we're on the edge of Annihilation. That can be some of the best gaming mm-hmm. ever! Are you kidding me? Like, it's all on the line, dude. If we get this wrong, we're done. The years that we've invested in this, all the great things that we've done... I, you know, this is something that's super important to me. It's all in line. Man, you're all in at that point. It's like yeah. gambling with money, the, right? The, it's like playing Texas Hold'em and put, the, going the, all in. The story that you can tell about going yeah. out with a bang is, like, that's a lifelong story. We almost succeeded. Yep. Right? And yeah. I, I rolled it. We had everything lined up. We did, da, 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 and I rolled the die. I needed 12. I got an 11. You know, whatever it is. And it just yeah. tells that story. And why is that important, man? Shit doesn't always go your way in life, yeah. right? Yeah. But you picked up and you kept going. It's teaching you resiliency. I mean, you're learning so many things from D&D. And uh, sure, you may fail. Your character may die. But guess what? You got the support network of people who are with you, right? Yeah. And they're going to be like, oh, man, you, oh, that sucks, dude. That's too bad. Why don't we roll up a new character? Yep, and then they're going to yep. welcome you in, and you're going to get back on your feet, and you're going to try again because guess what? Yeah. Life's going to kick you in the face more than one time, mm-hmm. and if you can learn to pick up and and lean on some friends because you may need it when you get kicked in the face a few times, right? <laughs> and pick up and go on, and then guess what? Someone else in the party is going to have some bad luck, and you're going to be able to be there for them and help them along. And that's how society works, you know. Yeah, and I think that's great. And that's it's just wonderful stories. Wonderful stories in D&D that, that are applicable to real life. 
And like the, 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 that reminds me of like the, the scene uh, when they were fighting Vecna in Stranger Things in season three. Like when you have those moments where everyone's just standing up and you're like, oh, we got to go. This is this is the last role, the last chance. Like yep. they never forget that forever. Like my wife will bring up situations that we've played with on stream or whatnot that I have forgotten. But because she was on that side. Which is like I still remember this. This still makes me cry every once in a while when when I lost this character and yeah. because it doomed us all in Icewind Dale. Yep. And dude, yeah. it's a game. It's a piece of yeah. paper. It has yeah. zero consequence on really your life. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah I, I've recently started running a uh, Oriental Adventures third edition game for my players, and we had played in one previously. And like one of the first stories that we started talking about with this was one of our other players losing his character in the very first battle of that other, you know, Oriental Adventures game. Because, you know, he's playing an honorable samurai and we, me and him basically kicked in the front door of this bandit hideout and then he just got killed right there on the doorsteps. And, you know. (laughs) It, it, it happens like, sometimes. Yeah, it sucks. Yeah. He had to make up a brand new character, and it was fantastic. You know, we all yep. just it, had a good time with it and roll with it. Yeah, and, so, and that's that's how a lot of things like Iraq's cousin happen, right? It's like, yeah. I don't want to name a new character. This one died. Scratch. Here's a new name. Here's the same character. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would... That okay. I, I got a qu- just a quick aside. I'll ask my next question. Well, I was playing Adventures League. We were we were playing Spelljammer. Well, Spelljammer books, and I had one player who just always ran into the worst luck, and he kept dying. But he was playing a Thycrean. So what we just kind of like table rolled was is every time he died, basically he threw up an egg and like hatched immediately and grew up immediately, and that was the next one. He went through five <laughs> variations of that character before they finally completed the whole the whole run through. He's but like was, a Gal- he's like a Gallifreyan Thraken, yeah. apparently. Right? Yeah, it's it's like the the movie Darkness Rising. Uh, <laughs> have you have you seen that, Luke? Uh, yeah, that's the one that has. Uh, was that? Um, uh, it's the one Felicia where. Uh, the Felicia- no, that's the Guild. Sorry. No, no, nope. yeah, that was that was Guild. No, if you have not seen Darkness, I don't think Rising, I have. I have not seen that one. Look it up. I think you can watch it on YouTube for free. Okay. It is okay. absolutely amazing. It's. It's about a group of players. There are three of them in the DM, and they just can't seem to get through this module that the DM has written. So they bring in another player uh, who happens to be a girl. Uh, so there's that whole you know conflict uh, going on right there of, oh, no, we brought in a female player. <laughs> Lord forbid. <laughs> really hitting uh, the stereotypes. Right. Yeah, but, but that's the point. Yeah. You know, by the end of the movie, she sort of turns them around to role-playing where it used right. to just be number crunching. Uh, right. But there, there's a scene in there. One of the players plays a bard, and this is third edition. And bards were notoriously really weak in third edition. Uh, so he his character just keeps dying to everything. <laughs> so he shows up for the last adventure, and he's literally... He, uh, he owns the local gaming store, so he pays his employees to make 52 character sheets of that character. So he, you know, they get into a fight. He dies. Up, oh, just rips a new character sheet. There you go. I keep going. <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh so uh, getting back to Gaxworks um, yeah. and your Kickstarter that did that, unfortunately for me, ended today. Right? It did. Yeah. Yeah. It ended uh, today. Um, I'm. I mean, we ran it 30 days. I don't know that I'll run it that long in the future because uh, yeah, we did great. In the early days, and then we yeah. you have this this, oh, this like middle ground, and then a nice little boost at the end. I mean, I'm very happy. We did over thirty five thousand dollars for this module, yeah. which is great. Uh, you know, uh, four hundred and ninety ish backers. Yeah, that's wonderful. I'm just so excited to get my products into people's hands that they enjoy it, and and I get to you know kind of share my uh, love of the game uh, with folks and in, in the world of Okram. Uh, uh, it's wonderful, and, and I expect, hopefully, you know, knock on wood, uh, the numbers of people will expand as I continue to develop, uh, develop uh, beyond these three modules in in fifth edition. I get a primer out there, and uh, we start some streaming where folks are going to be playing these games. Work on my Discord. Uh, we're going to have uh, uh, some content created uh, monthly for our Discord subscribers, where we can get like a, you know, a two 
two to four hour adventure out uh, every month mm-hmm. for them uh, that'll help uh, kind of flesh out various parts of the world of Oak Room and the city of Shintufi, uh, kind of where a lot of the action is, is centered. Um, so, so, yeah. W- uh, so, like this, like this uh, when I when I first learned about your Kickstarter it was only a couple of weeks ago, unfortunately. Can you tell us some about your setting and the modules? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So, uh, as I'd mentioned earlier, I was in the uh, army for uh, many years, and so I got to go to Iraq in 2010, uh, 2011. Uh, and man. I tell you what, it's pretty warm and wearing body armor out in 129 degree heat is not a lot of fun. And I thought, man, <laughs> I've had my D&D characters running around doing all sorts of crazy stuff, trying to like jump over things and carry backpacks and wear plate mail. So that's not, you know, that, that, that doesn't seem very realistic. So I, I mean, this, <laughs> that just resonated with me like, man, what a miserable place uh, this is. Uh, and I got back, and it wasn't really Gary Con. Gosh, it might have been Gary Con Five or something like that. And I decided I wanted to write the the uh, scenario that we would play in the Gary Con uh, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons tournament. Um, and and I was like thinking about, well, what? How do I want to write this? I'm like, man, there's you know, it's 2011, 2012, maybe. There's so much uh, Western, you know, tradition traditional folklore, you know, European, Western European stuff. Uh, wouldn't it be fun to do something different? And I was like, well, I just got back from, you know, kind of a, a deserty Middle East climate. What if I did something that's a little bit more, a little bit more Middle Eastern? Maybe it's, you know, a bit, a taste of the Maghreb, you know, North Africa or the Bosphorus and, and the Turkey region. A, you know, there's a crossing of cultures, but it's... Uh, really unpleasant environment in, in desert. And so I kind of came up with this world idea for Okram. Uh, it was a you know beautiful world, um, had a great, powerful society, the Adrissid Empire, that was able to harness elemental magics uh, to kind of tame their environment, much as we use technology today to you know make our lives more comfortable. They were able to build un- towers hundreds of feet into the air using earth elementals they you know uh, carved under, under the ground sewer systems and all sort of stuff their armies wielded uh you know a lance that would shoot lightning or fire or wind and these sorts of things and there was uh the most powerful of the uh casters the wizards you know ruled ruled the land well of course uh, as happens with all empires uh, something happened, and and they fell. There was a cataclysm. In this case, they had a civil war between two warring factions. Uh, and it turned out they uh, somehow unleashed a force upon the world that ended up destroying a lot of it and treating this once verdant land into uh, uh, something that was scarred with you know sands, blackened sands, black glass uh, in parts of it, the blighted lands, and their ancient civilization was buried underneath these sands and destruction and over time uh, people flowed back in and re-inhabited areas and the cities that are buried in the sands hold great fortune and powerful magic items that people want to see and it's a reason to go adventuring so it's a little bit uh, behind the world of Okrim uh, Okrim for those of you who are, are are crafty and look at it and kind of hold up a mirror or reverse it You'll notice it kind of looks like Morocco if it were turned backwards. <laughs> ah. Yes, and that is because my wife is Moroccan, and so I've delved into, I've uh, picked her brain a lot, and she's helped me uh, consult on it and, and do things. So uh, the world of Okram uh, is a little bit like Morocco in, in some senses, but of course, a crossing of many cultures and fantastic, right? There's unfortunately no wizards in, in Morocco that I know of. Uh, at this point, so unfortunately, uh, so it's a fantasy version of that, and uh, 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 you know, it, it, I wrote a bunch of tournament modules over many years for Gary Con, and I retired from the army last year. And I thought, you know what, this is a really fun place, and I would like to share it with other people. And so I started writing fifth edition adventures with my friend Matt Everhart, and uh, here we are with the the Aish and Tufi, the Hardish and Tufi. We just closed up the Fate of Shintufi Kickstarter, uh, the closure of this uh, trilogy. Uh, it takes place in the city of Shintufi in, in the world of Okram. Uh, it, sounds, he, 
it sounds it's like a, yeah, it sounds like a great setting for running modules or one shots very much so because you've mentioned that they've got the the lots of ruins and things in the desert so if you just need a location to run your players for four hours for one evening there you go yeah yeah and, and that was my intent is that uh it would just be an uh, add-on to uh your adventure hey you sail across the ocean and there you are in the lands of Ogrim, right which is different than uh what your traditional are often you know western uh, uh, uh tradition right and uh, uh it gives you an opportunity. And what I was thinking about this in 2012, 2013, and, and that sort of thing, uh, fifth edition hadn't been written, right? So mm-hmm. we're talking about first through fourth. People, you know, there wasn't that many new players, right? A lot of us had been around for a minute. And so popping, surprising us was more difficult. If we see a seven foot tall, kind of hunched over green thing with bushy black hair and a long nose, hey, it's a troll. Uh, you know, get out the fire, we have to burn it, it's going to regenerate, you know, etc. Oh, this thing it has, you know, magic resistance, it has about so many hit points, it, you know, can do these things, right? You know, oh, black pitting, you know, yeah, make sure you use the right stuff. Uh, so what I want to do is is just give you an excuse as a DM to reskin monsters, right? Yeah. You don't have to be super creative, just reskin the monster. So I do that. Don't I do that anyway. <laughs> yeah, just do it. So... Oh, uh, oh, shoot, what is this thing, right? Uh, Matt Colville also uses some pretty cool ideas for how to upgun your BBEG and what powers to give them. And, you know, you don't really have to stat them out. You just kind of give them, you know, some powers that they're going to do and, and make it yeah. work for your storytelling. So just little DM tips like that help you out, right? You're the DM. You don't have to be a slave to, you know, all the all all the numbers or whatever. It, it it it's an approach. Now you can run things that way, and and I, I honestly I've done it many times, where I just go by what the scenario or what I have pre what I've written, right? Uh, but then there's other times where I'm just going really for the story, and the creature has as many hits as it takes to make the tension in the peak of the story, right? Mm-hmm. Some people say that's cheating, uh, and it can be, uh, <clears throat> but I I just really think it's what your table wants, right? Are the rules? Uh, I think there was a quote from my dad, uh, and it said something to the effect of, um, "You know, uh, the dice are just for the sound they make when we roll them, right?" <laughs> so, you know, because behind the screen, you roll the dice. It can be whatever you want, right? But you yep. rolled the dice, and people are like, "Rolled the dice. What's going on?" Right? <laughs> so, you've got to keep what you have to keep is the is the shared. Uh, it is everyone shares the belief in the fairness of the rules, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, me telling you that I do something like that weakens that. So you should never, you should never tell somebody that sort of stuff. So, but I'm just giving DM advice here, right? So yeah. We're, yeah. We're, we're talking. But yeah, you can't let your players know that you fudge. If you fudge, never, don't let it out. Because that ruins the fun. That ruins fun. Let them think the dice gods were in their favor at that point, if you want to. Or, mm-hmm. or it's okay, crush them mercilessly if, if you can. But you got to read your table. You know, you got to read yeah. your table. Uh, and, and some folks will take it harder than others, right? I cried. I cried when my first D&D character bought it. I was a kid. I cried, man. I admit it. I, 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 it was terrible. Tomb of Horrors, my 10th level ranger. No! Ooh. That's uh, yeah. That's a that's a lot of levels. That's a long playtime for that one character. It, it was. He started off in T one in the village of Hamlet, and uh, he made it through D three, made it through the giant and the drow series, and then uh, he's tenth level. And one day I asked my dad, "Hey, I want to play some D and D, you know." And my sister and I, sister Heidi and I, were there, and she had a relatively low level character, like a fourth or fifth level character, and I had uh, my tenth level ranger. And he took us in the Tomb of Horrors. Why? I don't know. Because he, he got some us. particularly <laughs> bad news that day. Was he really just like, I really hate my children? I'm not sure what it was. Did you, you get an F on a report card or something? Yeah. I don't, yeah. Was it like April 16th or something? You just paid his taxes? I don't know. I don't I know. Only, I, I could only envision like you going up and going, like, hey, can we play some Tomb of Horrors? 
or Pleasant D&D, &D, he's like, yeah. yes, and like the anime villain eye, like sparkles and everything <laughs> comes out. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely i mean whatever that was you know maybe that just whatever his his day had had he's like oh yeah tomb of horror that's where i'm gonna take you uh, I, would, I would love to like like if there was a book of all knowledge just to say how many people did the gary gygax specifically kill the tomb of horrors let's see what that number actually is <laughs> is it in the tens of thousands hundreds of thousands <laughs> higher and then globally know. how many people have died in tomb of horrors that's definitely in the hundreds of thousands it's been a lot. A lot of people yeah. have died the two horrors. I mean, what a great adventure. And of course, of course, this came out of it's very early. It's like nineteen seventy nine or seventy eight or something. Mm -hmm. It was it's old. It is old. And it came out of a guy named a guy whose name was Alan Lucian. Uh was shared with my dad like a mummy tomb adventure. And my dad's like, Okay, this is pretty cool. And he's like, Huh, I bet I can upgun this a little bit. And so he did. And there was Origins, which was kind of a competitor to Gen Con, another convention that a convention yep. that my dad started, right? So in case people don't know this, Gen Con was started in Lake Geneva by the International Federation of War Gamers in nineteen sixty eight, right? So the Gen Con stands for Geneva Convention. <laughs> So that's what Gen Con stands for, right? Which is the rules of war, right? The Geneva yep. Convention. So so there you go. So that's ha 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 that he loved puns. Uh, okay, so <laughs> uh, yeah, so Origins was a competitor to Gen Con, which is a convention my dad started in Lake Geneva in 1968, now in Indianapolis, owned by my buddy Peter Edgison, and uh, a, 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 a great convention. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah Peter yeah. Ed. Mm -hmm. I, I Peter. used Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, Peter, Peter bought it. Peter owned Wizards of the Coast. He bought TSR, right, uh, when they were bankrupt from mismanagement. And uh, so he bought it, and then, due to the popularity of Pokemon card game, Hasbro purchased that from him. But Hasbro had no interest in running conventions. And so Peter very astutely said, well, if you don't want this, you know, garbage, I'll just I'll keep it. it. <laughs> I'll just keep it. Yeah, you, I don't want to saddle you with this burden, so I'll just keep this thing. Yeah, and he turned it around and made it into a very profitable thing. Yeah, so he, I, I always wanted to go to Gen Con because it was the gamer convention back then, and it was up in, like you said, Geneva. So I wasn't just going. You know, that's a long drive for me and everything. And then I was living in Bloomington, Indiana, which is about an hour south of Indianapolis. And then I moved to columbus ohio and then back to atlanta and pretty much the year i moved back to atlanta is the year that it moved to indianapolis oh, okay. so so i was like an hour or two away from it and yeah just timing never worked and i just haven't driven up there to go to it so. uh it's so gary con is small intimate uh you can walk up to a guest and uh you know assuming they're not in the middle of a game or some other function and say hello Chances are they're going to have a nice conversation with you, right? I mean, that's yep. that's the environment. Gen Con, it's 60, 70,000 people. Right, yeah. It's it's become massive over the years. Yeah. yeah, so it's not a place where you're going to, like, come up with people in, in, in chat unless you're already in that. And these are your, like, this is your social network. That would be yeah. the only way that, that that would happen. So, um, But Gen Con's cool. You get to see, oh, my gosh, their exhibit hall is vast. And there's so much cool shit going on. And True Dungeon rolls out. Just a great show. Um, and, of course, I love uh, Peter Adkison. is just a, a really nice guy whom I consider a, a, a good friend. And uh, I love to go there and support him. Awesome. So um, your your modules that you have, the the heart of Gentuli, I'm going to I, I butcher all names. He does. Um, he, he butchers so, all names. It's a hard name. So I named yeah. it Shintufi because that's my my mother-in-law who just passed away in February. Her oh. last name, her maiden name is Shintufi. And so I named it after after her. So it's the city of Shintufi. Her name was Zahra Shintufi. And so that's why I named it that. So that that is 5th edition, um, those modules. It is. It is. Um, and you have another Kickstarter coming out here soon. This is what I want to talk about. Oh, yeah. Strange oh, yeah. and Grim. Strange and Grim, uh, yeah. Which isn't 5th edition. It is right? not. It, it, it's, well, 
Honestly, it's kind of close. It's D twenty. So, it's all. It's a D. Yeah, it's a D twenty yeah. system. So based, based uh, off of D twenty modern, which I used to play way the hell back when. Exactly. So D twenty modern was like kind of the uh, third edition variant where you could be like, hey, you know, you le- you know how to play D anD D, right? Yeah, of course I know how to play D anD D, dude. Uh, do you want to play like modern era like? stuff do you want to be predator do you want to play alien do you want to you know do you want, oh yeah totally cool there's guns and stuff yeah and so that was it so they took that concept that same concept my uh friends at evil genius games a guy named dave scott uh said yeah i want to do that and so he reached out to jeff grubb and uh, built a team of uh creatives and did the everyday heroes uh rule set and dave's super smart guy and really savvy i wish i'd had this idea he licensed uh cool ips like escape from new york so (gasps) love that movie and rambo and stuff like that so you can go play everyday heroes escape from new york and you could be snake plissken or whatever adventure in snake plissken's new york and go on those sorts of missions how freaking cool is that man that's really cool and so uh, we were looking for us. So my friend Matt Everhart, who co-writes uh, the uh, the Shintupi series with me, really, really good guy. He's an Air Force officer. He's uh, at a senior service college right now. He's just going to be graduating very, very soon. Huge, huge honor. He's going to, uh, you know, knock on wood, be promoted to Colonel, full bird Colonel 06 in the Air Force, which is uh, no nice. small accomplishment. Yeah, so Congrats hats off to him. Yeah, hats off to Matt. Really, really great stuff. Uh, and so he was out in Asia doing an exercise for the past few days for the Kickstarter. So he's been uh, absentee on that. And, that. and that's why, if anyone wondered why Matt wasn't commenting, he's been out doing great things uh, for our nation. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, Strange and Grim, he's been working on this for a number of years. And he told me about it. And I was like, that sounds pretty cool. Let's let's publish it through Gaxworks. <clears throat> and uh, so we we were looking for a rule set, and we we're talking about it. And you know, do we want to make up a rule set? And I was like, man, that's you know, that's just hard. A, yeah, it's hard, and it's just bad business. If I'm a consumer, do I want to learn yet another <laughs> system? <laughs> no. no, no, we don't. No, I don't. I don't want to do that. I'm I'm as lazy as the next guy. I don't want to do that. So uh, I said, well. You know, what else is out there? And Matt's like, hey, man, this Everyday Heroes was pretty popular, and Jeff Grubb was involved, and, you know, he's a good designer. And I was like, oh, okay, Jeff's pretty cool. So I called Jeff and said, hey, man, can we license this thing? And he's like, actually, it's not me. It's Dave. And so I got to talk to Dave, and he agreed. He was very uh, nice gentleman and, and really uh, enjoyed uh, uh, speaking with him and working with him. And he's like, yeah, dude, do it. And so we got into the Everyday Heroes rules, and we're like, oh, man. Strange and Grim, it's it's set in a fan uh, a fictional world of Baynor, and uh, it's kind of informed by or modeled after the interwar period of of Earth, right? So between World War One and World War Two. Uh, so think Indiana Jones, The Rocketeer, Sucker Punch, uh, mm-hmm. Sky Captain, The World of Tomorrow, uh, and kind of sprinkle in like Arcane, which is pretty cool. I know it's a League of Legends. Uh, League of Legends yeah. property, but but Arcane, I thought they did a really nice job. The anime yes. was fantastic. Yeah, I yeah. loved it. Yeah. And then and then drizzle over the top a little bit of horror, a la Cthulhu, right? So yeah. something's happened recently, you know, in the not too distant past, and a world that was technologically based suddenly magic works, right? Oh. And there is, uh, you know, uh, you know. Uh, Items that can can be imbued with magic, you know, aether craft. I think is uh, the word we we landed on. Which, you know, yeah. it's hard. There's it's it's there's yeah. so many different terms out there. But I think we used aether craft. If I remember correctly. Uh, so you can have basically, you know, a big musket that shoots lightning bolts, right? You know, because it's got magic power in it or whatever, or a a bullet launcher or a sword or you know aether various tech, types of things. A- aether yeah. tech. Aether tech. Aether tech. That's right. Yep. Yeah. I forgot what I said. <laughs> Sorry, I was, made so much of that scotch. I was like, a little too deep in there. Uh, uh, but yeah, so Aether Tech, and and so essentially, you're you're uh, you know, there's uh, it's a bit of 
you know, it's an interwar period, but corp corporations are very important. So it, I don't know if you guys did, see you probably Chris didn't game in the nineties, but in the nineties that was a big that was a big uh, topic where you know corporations were a takeover and succeed governments essentially so oh, yeah be run by corporations right having, so, having having run hey, a lot of shadow run i'm very familiar they, with it there you go so very shadow run like so there's that running, shadow run aspect to it as well running man's one of my favorite movies yeah <laughs> running so man good. was great dude i loved uh, schwarzenegger was like i, I love Arnold schwarzenegger uh movies when i was a kid they're like totally amazing and uh yeah, yeah. predator I, I, predator I grew is up still probably him. the greatest movie ever made yeah Predator, and I even like Commando just because he took like, uh, you know, like buzzsaw <laughs> blades and used them like shurikens and threw them around. Like, yep. I can't, yeah. Oh, yeah. Remember what I said I'd kill you last, Sully? Yeah, that's I right, Matrix. Did. I lied. Yeah, right. <laughs> great stuff. I eat green berries for breakfast. So many cheesy lines. Just the, the best. The best stuff. They were the best. Yeah. Uh, absolutely wow. amazing stuff. But yeah, so Strange and Grim is going to be, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, uh, like I mentioned, kind of those those parallels. Indiana Jones, it's in a war period. Uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. There's, you know, yeah. weird stuff going on, and you are working to uh, to you know support the system and to prevent evil corporations from taking over. And worse, these kind of nutty cultist types who are trying to let the Cthulhu like uh, gods advance their cause, which will eventually destroy. And kind, of, kind of Hellboy, yeah. yeah, Hellboy, very much, yes. Yeah, there you go. That's a great. That's a that. That's great. And uh, you know, we played around with hit points and kind of came up with an edge system, which I know has been uh, there was edge in other games, that sort of thing. But we wanted to make a differentiation between kind of your 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 hit points or your your health when you're wounded, like actual wounds on your body yeah. versus your skill as a warrior uh, to avoid damage or whether it's luck or magical ability and those sorts of things, that's your edge, right? Uh, but once you're out of edge, uh, then you take wounds that can, it will slow you and kind of like exhaustion does in 5e, basically wear you down and, and, and make you less capable. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things we did that I don't think has been done in other systems is edge is not only something that you can use to kind of deflect or uh, lessen the consequences of an attack against you, you can use it to do cool shit for yourself. So you can up your upgun your attack or make an advantage on a skill roll or something like that by spending some of the edge you have as, you know, a hero or a notable character in the, in the, in the world. So yeah. ca kind of like sorcery points. A bit, yeah. A little yep. bit. Sure. Yeah, you get to spend them in a way, but it's also hit points. So if somebody blasts you in the face, uh, you know, you dodge out of the way, you slipped it, right? Uh, and, and you do that because you're fresh, you have experience, you were able to anticipate it coming, etc. cetera. Yep. Uh, but you can also, there's an edge economy. Uh, if you want, if you're fighting a real badass and you want to make sure you kind of almost a guarantee a hit on them, you can spend those edge points. But guess what? You're, you're gonna, you may need them later. So how much okay. do you want to spend? Where do you balance it? And we're limiting, uh, because 5th edition, like we mentioned, it's a little bit harder to challenge your players a lot of times. I mean, unless we're Chris, who gets at least <laughs> at least one a week. Uh, but, but for most of us, it's a little harder. And uh, uh, so we, we limited the short rest to one short rest between long rests. So you can't kind of take yeah. these, you know, five short rests on an adventure. That's the smart, yeah. <laughs> so um we we talked about systems for 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 a brief moment um yeah. what was your thought on the whole debacle at the beginning of this year with um the new license and all that stuff yeah i just think that was really a guy just a big misstep you know i there's lots of nice people at wizards of the coast uh i'm, yeah. I'm not i'm not a hater i i yeah. you know I respect a lot of uh, fellow creative folks who are out there and, and don't wish them any harm, but uh, God, it seems like somebody who didn't know what they were doing just really tripped all over themselves and 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 just made a what a way to alienate your your market and uh, try to change something that was clearly, very clearly meant to be long lasting. Now, if you want to change it and say, hey, you know what, we're gonna make 
sixth edition, and we are not going to license that sort of stuff. That's absolutely the right. I don't yeah. feel like they owe yeah. it to us. They're a business, and they're here to make money, and they have shareholders, and you know, I get it. So I'm not trying to. Uh, I'm not trying yeah. to say, you know, oh my goodness, this is like for the good of the world. Uh, but the agreement they made with the fifth edition stuff, that's not changeable. Yeah. Sorry, guys, you you can't just revoke that because you don't like it anymore. Uh, and and so them trying to do that, uh, to me, uh, just really burnt up a lot of goodwill. And, and the Pinkerton stuff, not a great, not <laughs> oh, a great. No. Yeah. 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 It, it it has been unfortunately, it has been just one misstep after another after well, another lately. It, and Jeff Jeff Easley, they took Jeff Easley's pick. pick oh yeah, uh, I heard, I heard. off the. Uh, Come on, man. I talked to Larry El so Larry Elmore, just a, what a great gentleman. And, and, my, uh, and, and my favorite artist of all time. So I love very talented, very talented and very, very nice human being. Just a great guy. If you get a chance to sit down and chat with Larry, do so. I would love Gary, to. Yeah. yeah, Gary Con 15 may have been the last. Con it was the only convention he went to in 23, or that he's planning on going to in 23. I'm going to ask him back in 24, but just to hang out, not to, he ran a booth, you know, mm -hmm. that was the last booth that he was ever going to run him and his wife, Betty. Um, so hopefully he'll come back just to hang out. Cause he has some family in the area because he is such a great guest. He's just such a good guy. And just chatting with him, uh, it, it is amazing, but they, uh, Paramount asked him to do the poster. And, uh, he was telling me the story. He's like, you know what? And he said this for years. So he's like, I just don't want to, paint for other people. I keep raising my prices and people keep paying it. He's like, you know, I raise it to 10,000, 15,000 and 20,000. And he's like, people just kept paying it. I just could, I was like, I figured, who the hell would want to pay a painting for me for that much money? That's ridiculous. Oh. Uh, but, but yeah, so uh, he had to tell them, no, he's like, you know what? I really just want to paint for myself. I only have so many years left. I've painted for other people. I don't want to paint for other people anymore. And uh, so he told them, no, he told Paramount, no, and that was like hard for him <laughs> because there was a big amount of money. Oh, I'm but sure. He's like, yeah. but he's like, you know what? Jeff Easley is super talented. This is the guy you want. And so Jeff did the piece, right? And uh, and then they took the, the signature off. That was just, yeah. that's, I, sorry, I had, that's I, had, I, I had read that there was, and this may or may not be true. This is internet. Yeah. But what I had read was that it was another company that was involved in the marketing of it. Or some yeah. such that had had yeah. to remove it. It could have been That's, E one, E one, or the or marketing Paramount. firm hired yeah. by E one, right? Yeah. But either way, it's definitely that's that's a misstep. Uh, like yeah. you don't remove an artist's signature from their art. Don't yeah. ever do that. Yeah. And just FYI, a leadership principle: weaseling like that. Ooh, it wasn't my fault. I'm not going to take responsibility. It was somebody we hired. That's weaseling. That's waffling. That's 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 yeah. crappy leadership. As a leader, don't do that. So you know what? I hired that firm. We failed to supervise them, and they took that off. I accept responsibility for that. We're gonna we're gonna fix it going forward, or whatever it is, right? Yeah. That's way better than trying to weasel out and say, "Well, was my fault." Was my fault. Yeah. That's just yeah. weak. That, that's weak, and it it just makes people angry. I I know we're in we're in a video call right now, Luke, and yeah. uh, but like behind me here is uh the 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 ice double that i used that i commissioned a friend from for my first module in dm's guild and this the other photo is a giant photo that a friend made of mine that i put on tuba refurbishment uh i'm i i didn't take their signatures off i may have cropped them out by accident just so it could fit on the page but you know <laughs> I, you just you never take it off like i i respect these guys way too much for that, that i didn't even, i didn't even know that happened that that was that, that was brand new information for me yeah, um, no. I was, well, I was talking. Uh, Joe, I was I was working out this morning, and and uh, Joe Meganello gave me a call, and we were chatting about things, and that was one of the things that. <laughs> what, what a casual perfect. sentence that would never happen to <laughs> normal people. Well, it just well, I mean, it. I just we hadn't chatted for a little while, and so yeah. we were talking about various things, and we're like, oh yeah. So Joe is. Uh, uh, Joe loves Dragonlance, right? There's no. Yeah, I know, and I right? can't. I cannot wait to see what they do with this. Right, and and so you know, my understanding is he's been working on a, a, a Dragonlance treatment uh, mm -hmm. that would go into a series or whatever, and so he's hopeful. And and so we were kind of discussing what the chances are there, and you know, uh, yeah, I think Joe 
obviously he read it as a boy, but now he's a man, right? So he wants to advance Dragonlance into a mature realm, right? Because it deals with a lot of, uh, you know, uh, serious issues, yes. right? Uh, in, in, in the Dragonlance series. And to do that as a PG type of, you know, work is more difficult than you can really get at some different, you know, and, and hit it a little harder if it's meant for mature audiences, right? You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and so will, uh, you know, will Hasbro be interested in that at this point in time? Or are they still kind of in the early Marvel series where it was all PG-13 stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and so that's a question. And anyway, we're just talking about, we're just talking about things in general. And then we, oh yeah, can you believe this happened to Jeff Easley? Because Jeff, we both know Jeff. We both love Jeff. Uh, who's just a, a really talented guy. Very quiet, very reserved. Je I mean, I'm telling you, gamers are good people in general. And mm -hmm. uh, a lot of these artists are just super, super kind and and great people. So I've, I've had the pleasure of working with, you know, Larry Elmore, uh, working with... They've created a piece of art for Gary Khan, and they've been generous enough to do that. I, I don't want, you know, uh, working with that. So, so but, you know, certainly Larry Elmore, uh, Jeff Easley, uh, Errol Otis, um, you know, gosh, Charles Urbach, who's a little bit of a newer artist, but man, is he talented. That guy's great. Jeff Butler, uh, you know, they've all done artwork uh, for yeah. me. And, uh, and uh, Real quick, ha have you watched the uh, documentary on Amazon, Eye of the Beholder? Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, the guy who created it, who put it together, comes to Gary Khan. So yes. Oh, okay. I, I, I figured you had. A, I knew it was a, kind yeah. of a silly question, but I, I I've watched that one a few times, and it I love it. It's fantastic because it it gives people who are outside like me, myself, you know, it gives us a little bit of an insider look at the how things were at that time period. Oh uh, yeah, and, and it covers four of just the absolute greatest artists that I've ever seen in my lifetime. So. Yeah, I uh, so I have a funny story. So this will be my parting shot because I got to cook some dinner for my kids. Sure, but yeah. uh, 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 <laughs> oh, this is terrible. I haven't told the story in forever. So it's the early mid seventies, probably. I'm five, so it's 1975, <laughs> 76, and my the TSR headquarters is just in a in a home, right? It's in a home that's been used as a business. So mm -hmm. uh, upstairs. There's a back room with uh, two drafting tables, and it's Dave Sutherland and Dave Trampier uh, who are sitting at, and they're facing each other at these, you know, drafting boards facing one another. And then there's a desk. I think Tom Wom sat at that desk, and a little sofa that was kind of to the side. So uh, I would go up there. I was a boss's kid, right? So I'm just running around. My brother Ernie was like 15 or 16, and he would run the hobby shop uh, in the front. You know, first room when you walk into the house. This is I was on the second story, and so there's this, there was a silly thing, and this is this is probably very hard for people to understand uh, of today's age. But if you were old, you get it. You would you would play a game where you would where you would hit somebody in the groin as if another <laughs> another man, right? And, yeah, we we know this game, right? This right. Game. So right, but this is something we don't share usually uh, publicly. So. It's very silly, and obviously we don't. I don't encourage this today, or no. Or, and I think it's completely out of out of bounds in today's rules and, and that sort of thing. So I do not encourage this and advocate this in any any way, shape, or form. But my brother would call it goomping, so which is a silly word, goomp, right? Okay. Just because I think it's the sound you'd make if you got hit in the that's groin, a, right? Yeah, that's accurate. Yeah, and so he said, "Hey, I bet you can't. Uh, uh, I bet you." Uh, just, I, I want you to check this out. I want you to to goof Dave Sutherland. And I was like, well, I can't do that. He's a big guy. He's an adult. And he's like, check it out. Go ahead and tell him you can tie his hands. And then go ahead and tie his hands with rope. And then say, okay, get out. And then he's going to try to untie the knots and just <laughs> punch him in the in the groin. Right? So I'm the boss's kid. I'm five. He walks in. He says, yeah, he's like, hey, you, I'm going to tie your hands. And, and Dave, what a nice gentleman. He's just a good guy, right? And so I tied up his hands as a five-year-old. And then uh, as soon as he started trying to get free, I was just like, wail, you know, <laughs> like wailing your arms, oh, no. like windmilling oh. your arms at him. And he's trying to protect himself and that sort of thing. So uh, 
it was very, it was, it was, it was terrible. So he managed to hold me off and get his hands <laughs> free. And my brother Ernie was falling down on the ground, <laughs> laughing as a fifteen-year-old would would be want to do yeah. in this. In this, he, just, he just got his little brother to do something really <laughs> dumb, <laughs> really, really dumb. And to Dave Sutherland's credit, he was absolutely not mad at me and didn't, you know, yeah, it could have been very easy for an adult to, you know, throw me across the oh, room sure, as a yeah. little boy or something like that. What a super nice guy he was. And Dave Trampier, very funny. And Tom Wom is still around, comes to Gary Con. So yeah, so no, these, I mean, these artists are just great, great people, really down to earth folks. And uh, to yeah. see Jeff Easley's name taken off something, who is just the kindest guy. He's always, always, you know, he give, he's the give you the shirt off his back kind of, kind of, kind of guy. Uh, that just really made me upset to uh, yep. upset. So, I, so here's to hoping that Wizards recognize that sort of stuff and takes a little bit more caution in in the way that they treat uh, some of the founders who are still around. Like, you know, Ed yeah. Greenwood. Ed Greenwood did not get a thank you in the D&D movie. Neither did Dave Arneson or my father yeah. uh, who created the game. So I noticed that. Um, yeah, and I know there was a big to-do with uh, Tracy Hickman and Margaret Weiss. There was a, a whole lawsuit yes. that went on for a while over Dragonlance and such. But... Yeah. Yeah, we no, don't... And, we... Uh, we're all we're we're here at the the grumpy dungeon master side. I definitely think it's not the creatives, you know, or the people no, trying to get no things God together. No. Yeah, it's yeah. nope. Margaret Weiss lives in Lake Geneva and comes to pretty much every Gary Con. Tracy Hickman's been there once. He's always welcome back, but he's a very busy fellow as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I mean, just, just if you want to meet, I, I they say don't meet your heroes. I would say nope. Come to Gary Con. Come to Lake Geneva. Uh, go wanna, to GaryCon.com uh, yeah. and and. And meet your heroes, because you know what? Pretty much all these all these folks are really, really nice people. That's right. Meet your heroes and play some D and D with them. That's yeah, and play a game with them because they'd be excited to do it. They're not uh, aloof or any of that sort of thing. All like right. I said, yeah, I mean, I got to play D and D with a bunch of Joe's uh, gaming group that he brought to Gary Con, and they just came as gamers. We didn't bill them as stars, and it's, we just yeah, hey, yeah, just here, come here to play they, some they're, games. They're, they get they were there to play games. Dude, they had a ball, and they had a blast. And I played, I played some D and D with uh, Vince Vaughn and you know Paul White. Dude, they were s having so much fun. They were serious gamers, and they hung out and talked with people uh, when they bumped into them in the hallway or whatever, or around the gaming table, and swapped gaming stories, just That's like cool. you do with other people. Because yep. guess what? They're gamers. That's, well, that's what we all do. <laughs> that's what we do. <laughs> It's yeah. what we love. Have you have you played at uh, Joe's? Uh, was it what's he called the Gary Gygax Memorial Dungeon? Not his new one. I was talking. That's what one. I was talking to him today about. Is we gotta we gotta figure out a time where I can get over there and play because now COVID's over. I get back there. So before COVID, to his old house, I went there and yeah. uh, played a few times. And yeah, it's just, it was a nice setup. And he showed me pictures of his new place, like when it was all like being constructed and that sort of thing. I was like, mm -hmm. bro, this is going to Kill. This is such a sweet I, setup. Yeah, I they're, saw they're, the they're... video of them putting in that table that he had oh. custom made for the place, and <laughs> he, he has a video on Instagram right now where he's showing yeah. off his custom Demogorgon from. <laughs> Dude, some... pretty sweet. Oh. Yeah, yeah, he's got some nice stuff. He's got some killer swag. He's got killer gamer <laughs> swag. But yeah, Joe, Joe is a nerd's nerd. This guy's like well steeped in nerd knowledge. I mean, he will go off on some tangents. I'm like, damn, dude, you are a nerd. That's like <laughs> stuff. Yeah, that's what we love. Yeah. All right, so, uh, so you, you do have to go. So we do want to get the the one Craig fact from you that we ask all of our guests. One quick fact for Craig that well, you would I like think, to add to him. Yeah, I think Craig, Craig, uh, I mean, he's kind of quiet, but I heard the glass tinking a few times. I think he's drinking uh, a lot of scotch during these shows. So scotch uh, he's, drink. a, he's a big fan of the space side uh, scotches. So that's that's what I heard about Craig. Yeah. I, okay. I could see that. Yeah, I mean, you're you know, as a bard, you tend to be in uh, bars and places of ill repute quite often. So having a good solid drink of choice seems like a thing for Craig. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for coming out and talking with us. Um, it's been a pleasure. huge pleasure, um, and, and it was really exciting to just hear all the stories. And you're welcome back whenever you like. Um, and maybe and, maybe if things work out, we'll see you at Gary Con hopefully next yeah. year. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh I'd yeah. Love to see you guys. Yeah, you, you you should make it out, dude. I mean, you, you'll see me in the hallway, and I'll probably be like, "Hey guys, that's how's it going?" Because I'm like swamped at GaryCon, but yeah. but you will have a good time, and you will meet 
lots of good people, and I'd be shocked if you don't get several guests that would come on come on your show and make those connections mm-hmm. in, in that sort of stuff. So it would be well worth it. And honestly, if you're doing this, you could probably write it off as a business expense somehow. We so. could. <laughs> yes, we I'm, could. I'm just I'm just learning how all that works. <laughs> So. Well, definitely learn it. It's it's totally worth it because yeah. it saves you on the tax end, right? Whatever your tax yeah. bracket is, an LLC or however you're doing business. Yep. Uh, yeah, it's important. And and knowing that stuff, believe me, know the business things. My dad didn't yeah. know the business stuff, and it bit him in the tail pretty hard. So yeah, yeah, that's that's a good lesson. Yeah, we're we're oh. learning and we're learning quick. <laughs> well, again, thank you very much, and I um, hope to talk to you again soon. Yep. All right, guys. Later. Thanks much. Bye. Take care, man. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.